So welcome everybody to our uh, final presentations from all of our interns who are really uh, so proud of everybody from what they've learned and what they've done. And uh, I, I also want to thank all of the mentors and all of the, the people who have contributed so much to your education, to your broader, to the broader education, uh, and your uh, and. All, all, all of you here who have uh, been either in the clinic or been uh, managers or mentors makes just such a huge difference. Uh, we appreciate all of the infusion of new ideas and enthusiasm and uh, we know that that energy that you bring and you know when you are an early 20 something <laughs> and the world is your oyster and you think all things are possible uh, we like that to rub off on our faculty and our beliefs that every year we get a new infusion of that. So we still believe that all things are possible and that makes us, that brings you, and, and our, that mix makes everyone more, uh, all of you more mature and us, shall we say, I wouldn't say exactly immature, but more, more, uh, uh, more useful in our view and more excited and it keeps our enthusiasm uh, at, a, at, at a high level, and, and uh, it's, it's a way that I, I, I make sure that all of us maintain the energy to constantly want to do new things and the right thing. So um, we thank all of you for your contributions to us as well. So, um, so I am Mike, and I'm the clinical coordinator for the ISPY2 trial. And you know, the biggest thing I've learned this year in transitioning from my role as an intern to a coordinator was actually how to still work because, you know, we're all friends, you know, all the interns, you know, we get together and you kind of at work, you kind of have to realize, you know, there's a professional side and then a social side and kind of balancing that was like the hardest thing in transitioning from, you know, being an intern to a coordinator. So um, I think that I was successful, you know, Tessa may have, you know, gotten the brunt of that transition, but I think we're better now. <laughs> so we work in the same office as well, so. Um, okay, so actually this year at the um, ASCO annual meeting in Chicago, I w had the opportunity of creating an abstract um, and a poster for uh, the quality of life sub-study as part of the ISPY2 trial. Um, and I'm going to present a little bit about what I presented at ASCO now. So just a little bit about the ISPY2 trial background. Um, for those of you, of you who are not familiar with it, it's actually an ongoing phase two trial that screens uh, novel agents in the new adjuvant setting, meaning we give these drugs prior to the patient going to surgery. Um, the biggest thing we're trying to do is compare the efficacy of these novel agents in combination with standard of care to see if they're more effective than just the standard of care. And we use the pathologic complete response as our primary endpoint. That means at the time of surgery, um, there's no cancer left in the samples that we take out. So what we first do you know, when on the trial is we get a new patient and we screen them for eligibility. Um, if they're eligible, then we randomize them. And you know, patients get, get, can get randomized to just the standard of care. If they're HER2 positive, they also get Herceptin. Um, but there's also a possibility that they get some sort of investigational agent as well. And it's the, this combination of investiga you know, investigational agent plus the standard of care that we're really interested in, um, in terms of efficacy and safety. Um, so this lasts about 12 weeks, and then they move on to another standard chemotherapy regimen called AC, which lasts about 8 to 12 weeks. Then they have a little break, and they go to surgery. And then once you know, they go to surgery, we have a five-year follow-up period in which you know, we do follow up to make sure to see if they have recurred or if they're still stable. Um, and so this is where the quality of life sub-study comes in, is when, these, when we give these novel agents, um, we, don't, you know, we don't really know how this affects the toxicity profiles of the standard of care regimens. Paclitaxel and AC, we already kind of know, pretty, we have a pretty good idea about what kind of side effects that they have, but once we you know, introduce these new agents, we completely alter the toxicity profiles, and which could lead to short-term changes in QOL, quality of life, QOL, or long-term changes. So our primary goals in this sub-study is to really evaluate at, you know, the changes of quality of life while we give them treatment, and as well as after they go to surgery, if these uh, changes in their quality of life continue to go with these patients. And you know, we also get to study the impact of providing prognostic information to patients, because we do um, mammoprint testing, which gives them a low or high risk profile. 
uh, MRI results, which kind of give them, you know, we let them know their progress as they receive treatment. Um, and then the pathologic complete response if, you know, if they have one and if they don't have one. Um, so all of these things can impact a patient's quality of life. So we actually use some established measures um, in our quality of life questionnaires that have been validated in many cancer types. The EORTC uh, questionnaire core um, have been evaluated, you know, many types of different uh, cancers. And so there's 53 total items in this, um, the EORTC. Um, 30 of the items are, you know, just general to all cancer types, but they focus on physical function, cognitive, emotional, function, stuff like that. And there's 23 more items that are a little bit more, uh, you know, pointed towards breast cancer. Um, very specific, like sexual function, hair loss, you know, skin changes, pain and swelling. Um, so this is uh, the EORTC. And we also look at another one called the uh, NCI's promise items. And there's some content overlaps. So if you look at um, what's in green um, for both of them, you know, we kind of ask the same questions, but it gives us the opportunity to compare and contrast uh, how patients respond to each of those questions, even though they're asking the same thing. Um, so another goal of ours is just to really look at um, if there's any content overlap in, you know, which one's a better measure. Uh, besides that, we have a fear of recurrence scale, and this is really important, especially for patients who are receiving neoadjuvant treatment, because throughout the time we're, you know, have they're not going to surgery first to remove the cancer. We're asking them to leave the cancer in while we treat them to try to shrink the tumor. So the, we want to know that if the fear of the cancer coming back has um, increases you know, throughout treatment based on how long um, it is until they go to surgery. And then you know, with every time point, we, give, um, we use the NCCN's distress <coughs> thermometer, which they just circled you know, 0 to 10 from no distress to high distress. Uh, so the timeline of the questionnaires you know, the first one we give baseline to all new patients, whether or not they are eligible for the study um, or not. And then the next one will be at day one when they, if a patient actually starts treatment. Um, then we give, you know, we have strategic time points at which we give these uh, questionnaires. So the next one would be at interregiment between the taxol after they finish their investigational agent um, and right before they go to AC, right after they finish AC. And then we have four more um, during follow-up period, which are also very important. So why do we even care about looking at quality of life for these patients? You know, these are, this is a phase two trial. You know, all of these drugs have been evaluated in phase one setting, so we know the side effects. But the thing is, we have diff a lot of different investigational agents. So if we have two agents that, you know, show the same, you know, similar PCR outcome, same survivability, so then the difference in toxicity and how these patients, you know, are affected by the toxicity is what we really care about. Is if there's one drug that has less side effects and better tolerated, maybe that's the one that we want to use if there's the same outcome. And this actually brings up a good point is because the toxicity of these investigational agents could have a big effect on if the patient takes these drugs or not, especially if the drugs are taken orally at home. So, you know, we as a clinical coordinator, I document things such as you know, grade one anxiety, grade one diarrhea, but grade two diarrhea, but to me that really doesn't, you know, mean a whole lot, but that's five to ten episodes a day, and to the patient that could be extremely debilitating. And, you know, the FDA really focuses on grade three toxicities, but we want to know if the grade one and grade two toxicities are really making a big difference for these patients. And if, you know, if a patient is unwilling to take a drug because they're having they can't even get out of bed or they're afraid to go out because they don't know when, you know, they're going to go to the bathroom next, that's a big problem. And in the end, our patients are not metastatic. So, you know, we, our patient population has a curable cancer. And if we cure their cancer, they have a long time that they can live. And these called this, the impact of, uh, that these side effects have on their quality of life could be carried forward for many, many years. Um, so if that's the case, you know, we want to know what kind of impact that we're, these drugs are having on their lives so we can, you know, make better decisions and inform these patients better on in the future. You know, and exactly, the more we understand about them, the better off our patients are. So some future work that we're doing is actually putting these questionnaires on an online platform so they can, patients can fill it out uh, at their convenience, you know, on a tablet or mobile device. Um, and another thing that we're actually working on is um, using a patient reported outcomes of the CTCAE, which is 
what we use to document adverse events, but it gives the patients um, the opportunity to report their own adverse events in their own words instead of having, you know, relaying it to the physicians and the coordinators and then reporting it back that way. Um, and we actually, so there's, there's actually recently, I think earlier this week, a um, article being written in the Journal of Oncology Practice that talked a little bit about um, why it's really important to select the correct measures when we look at quality of life. So earlier I talked about the EORTC um, versus the promise items, how there's um, content overlap. Well, you know, some of these questions might be better for the patients, but then physicians might look at another system and say, this is a better measure. So, you know, this study really helps us um, kind of hash that out and see which one is better for both. Um, and so just to finish things off, I just want to, you know, say thanks to a few people. Um, Dr. Malisco and Dr. Esserman gave me the opportunity to create this abstract and present at ASCO, which is an amazing opportunity. Um, so if any of you guys have an opportunity to attend maybe San Antonio or ASCO annual meeting in Chicago, it's, it's amazing. So I would urge you guys to do that. Um, Roxanne Jensen is one of, the, uh, one of the most important people to get this quality of life uh, study um, initiated back in 2012. Um, Julia helped me a lot this year just you know, being my manager and um, I've worked here for about almost three years now and you know, Julia was the one who hired me, so. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> so that, thanks to her. Um, Jane Perlmutter is our patient advocate. She's amazing and she has done a lot for ice by 2 trial and especially for the quality of life study as well. And I just want to thank all the trial investigators and the research nurses and our coordinators across all the sites and you know, Quantum Leap Healthcare, the Biomarker Consortium, Safeway Foundation, Bill Battles Foundation, and all of our patients as well. Sure. So my name is Kelsey Natsuhara, and I've been the Ice by 2 Program Management Office intern this year. I've also worked on the Ice by 2 Low Risk Registry with Dr. Chen and been a part of Decision Services. So thank you to all of the clinic staff for allowing us to be a part of your team. And the biggest lesson I've learned this year is actually something Laura said to me on a bus on the intern hike, which hopefully you guys will get to do as well. And she told me that it's not enough to have a good idea. You have to know how to turn that idea into a reality. And I think that's the biggest thing I've learned here at the BCC is that people here not only know how to think innovatively, but they know how to put it in the work on the back end to make that actually happen. So I hope you guys have a great year because it's been wonderful. So my independent project was assessing the feasibility of centralized IRB implementation in the ISPY2 trial. And so a little bit of background, institutional review boards have been around for the past 40 years and their primary purpose is to protect patients both from a safety and an ethical standpoint. And today as more and more studies become multi-site collaborations, now institutional review board approval is requ required from each individual site that is part of a larger study. And as you can imagine, this is very time and cost intensive, intensive and also leads to a lot of local, oops, and also leads to a lot of variability in local review. So let's think about this in the context of the ISPY2 trial. So in ISPY2, we have 20 sites, and I'm saying 20 because we're being optimistic and thinking that British Columbia is going to open soon. Um, <laughs> and so we have 20 sites, and this means that we have 20 IRB reviews. So it's not hard to see why this is so time and cost intensive. This requires effort from all of the clinical coordinators, from each individual site IRB, and from our UCSF program management office staff to make this happen. In addition, each local IRB is allowed to make small changes to the study consent forms to address local concerns. And we have ice by sites all across the country and soon in Canada. And so you can imagine how site concerns at, say, University of Alabama might be very different from those here at UCSF based on regional culture, patient levels of education, demographics, etc. And this is what leads to that variability in local review. And this is of particular concern since we're talking about informed consent documents, which is the primary way that patients decide whether or not to participate in clinical research. So what's the solution? We've mentioned three big challenges here, time, cost, and variability. And we think that the solution lies in centralized IRBs. So with a centralized IRB, we still have 20 ice by 2 trial sites but only one IRB review. All of the local IRBs give up local control and defer to a single central IRB. <laughs> um, so what is a centralized IRB? As you can probably guess, a central IRB serves as the single IRB of record for a, single, for a study. CRBs aren't new, they've been around since 1960. But in the past 10 years, they've gained much wider acceptance. In 2006, the FDA issued guidance on the use of centralized IRBs 
And even before this, in 2001, the National Cancer Institute was an early adopter and developed its own central IRB for its phase three adult oncology trials. And in 2003, a Journal of Clinical Oncology paper evaluated the NCI CRB and showed that it was associated with a $700 savings in initial protocol review and saved 34 days on the time it took to review a protocol. So you can see that CRBs are an efficient way to speed up the clinical trial process. ISPY2 isn't a phase three trial, so it doesn't fall under the NCI's umbrella. However, there are many commercial CIRBs that serve a much broader range of study phases and research fields. So we wanted to know whether or not CRB use in the ISPY2 context specifically would save time and money. And secondly, is this actually feasible? And we're looking at feasibility at two different levels. So first at the centralized IRB level. Mike talked a lot about why ISPY2 is such a different trial. And so this unique study design is not something that CIRBs are familiar with. So we didn't know if they had the infrastructure to serve a unique trial like ISPY2. Secondly, from a site willingness perspective, here we go. From a site willingness perspective, are local IRBs actually willing to give up control and defer to a centralized IRB? So on to that first question. Will CIRBs actually save time in ice by 2 The current situation, sites are given 60 days to obtain IRB approval when a new amendment is released. But how does this actually play out? So when ice by 2 Amendment 9 was released, the median length of time to gain approval was 56 days. So sites are taking just about that full two months to gain approval. And that range was 21 to 167 days. So some sites are taking three, almost three times the length given. And this might be because, because academic IRBs only meet twice a month. And so it leads to that almost two month review period. Conversely, commercial CIRBs meet two to three times a week and have an average length of approval of one week. So yes, CIRBs are faster. <laughs> Second question, do CIRBs save money? Currently, we give sites $2,000 a year for IRB fees, which is $40,000 annually. But since we hope that ice by two is around for a long time, let's look at five-year costs. So it costs $200,000. The cost with CIRBs, I looked at three different commercial CIRBs fee schedules, um, taking into account their initial protocol review fees and then four years of ongoing review. And as you can see, in all three of these scenarios, commercial CIRBs are faster, or less expensive, <laughs> pardon me. So on to the feasibility question. Can a commercial CIRB serve the ice by 2 trial? These are all the different commercial CIRBs we reached out to to speak with them about their experience with early phase high risk studies like ice by 2 and also to talk with them about their experience working with multiple academic centers. And we were able to identify three companies with which um, we thought ice by 2 could work. So Western IRB, Schulman Associates, and Quorum Reveal. So we moved forward with them and spoke to them about the specifics of ISPY2. And we were able to identify some challenges, particularly the unique structure of ISPY2. So Mike talked about that we have multiple different drugs for many different drug companies in a single trial. Furthermore, we have this standing trial platform where we have a master protocol that goes over all of the basics of the trial, and then each drug has its own specific appendix at the end. This is a unique structure, and many centralized IRBs weren't sure if they would treat this as one study, as we hope, and is in the spirit of ice by two, or if they would treat all of these separate drug appendices as their own studies. However, there's also some benefits to working with a centralized IRB. First and foremost is that commercial IRBs are just that, they're commercial, they're for-profit companies, and this gives them a level of flexibility and a motivation to want to work with us because they want our money. <laughs> and secondly, um, the standing trial nature of ice by two guarantees them prolonged business. So many of these companies are willing to work with us at a reduced cost because they know that we'll be around for a while. So, yes, commercial CRVs do have the capacity to work with ice by two. Moving on to the site feasibility question. Are sites willing to give up local, local control and work with a CRB? So what we actually found is that many ice by two sites have already worked with centralized IRBs. Schulman Associates has worked at, with nine out of 20 of our sites, Quorum with 10 out of 20, and our big winner here was Western IRB with 19 out of 20 sites that have contracts in place. So, many of these sites, however, have only worked with centralized IRBs in late phase and minimal <coughs> risk studies. But there's nothing actually in their contract that prohibits them from working with a centralized IRB for early phase high risk studies like ice by 2 The only barrier is site willingness. And this is a problem I think that we can face. So our goal is that all sites would accept CRB use for ice by 2 
And we feel that sites should be comfortable with this model because at this point, every site has already gone through at least one full local IRB review. And secondly, iSpy2 has been running since 2010 and at this point has gone through over 200 site reviews with no rejections to date. If sites still aren't comfortable with this, we have an alternate proposal in which we could keep one site IRB so that the protocol is always being reviewed at any point by at least one academic center. So in conclusion, we think that this is possible. We think that centralized IRBs in iSpy2 is a good idea. They're faster and more cost effective than the local IRB model. Central IRBs do have the capability and infrastructure to work with a unique trial like iSpy2. And thirdly, we believe that sites will be willing to work with a centralized IRB. Especially with Western IRB, 19 out of 20 sites already have a contract in place, and this would really facilitate transferring the review process from local IRBs to centralized IRBs. So next steps, I'm actually speaking with Western IRB this afternoon to talk about our five-year quote <laughs> for iSpy2. Um, and next we would set up a webinar with all of the iSpy2 site chairs to introduce the concept of centralized IRBs and hopefully um, working with Western IRB. And thirdly, to incorporate the CIRB contracting process into the general iSpy2 new site contracting procedures to facilitate this process moving forward. So we hope it's not long before central IRBs in iSpy2 are a reality. So thank you so much for your time and for a wonderful year. Yes, uh, my name is Richard, often mistaken for Mike. Uh, but uh, this year I've been working on a variety of the surgical trials and helping uh, get started a few other trials uh, here at the BCC. So hopefully we'll have a few more trials um, in the next few months. Um, and to talk about my most important lesson, I guess, that I learned this year, um, it has to be that just getting information to patients is so important. Uh, the first clinical trial patient I ever enrolled here uh, was 24 hours away from having a mastectomy before she found out about the trial that I coordinated. And so she was able to get on the trial uh, with this short notice and has not had surgery anymore. She just has taken letrozole to treat her DCIS. And so it was just this big difference of being able to find out about a trial online um, last minute and getting onto it. So without things like that, um, I think it's that we're missing a lot of patients. And so one of the things I want to do moving forward is find ways to increase the availability of this information for patients. So hopefully more patients will have similar kinds of stories to be able to find out these solutions um, and make the right decision that they want. So anyways, uh, today I'll be talking about the, the tipping trial uh, and the Micromets trials. We, over the past year, we've been doing a lot of cleanup on the follow-up data and we finally uh, did a bit of preliminary analysis and I'll talk a little bit about the results from those today. But um, before we get started, I wanted to introduce the trial because I know a lot of you here don't know about the trial. But this trial, the two trials were run from 1999 to 2012 um, by Dr. Park, Dr. Esserman, um, and a few other co-PIs. And we enrolled 1,121 patients into these trials. And today I'll be talking specifically about the circulating tumor cells and disseminated tumor cells results. So these are CTCs and DTCs. Um, so what are CTCs and DTCs? Uh, this figure kind of shows what exactly they are, but they're basically tumor cells that have detached from the primary tumor and entered a patient's circulatory system. And so the idea is that these may be precursors to distant metastasis, and these may exist in a patient's circulatory system for some time even after treatment. Um, if we can identify these cells and maybe even detect these cells in patients, maybe this is somehow correlated with a poor prognosis. Some patients may have high levels of CTCs and DTCs that remain in their system, and others have low CTCs and DTCs. So we just want to kind of figure out what does this mean, and this is, part of, this is the reason why we collected these cells from patients on the tipping and micromet studies. So different meta-analyses have been conducted on CTCs and DTCs over the past few years to kind of compare different trials that have collected this information. And the general uh, conclusion from these analyses was that there is some prognostic significance from these circulating tumor cells and disseminated tumor cells. What this means is that they did find that patients who had higher levels of CTCs or DTCs had some worse outcome. But it's still unclear as to whether or not we can use this to predict, um, to, to alter treatment decisions for patients. So how did our study compare to that? And that's kind of what I'll be talking about today. Um, 
And to understand this a little bit more, uh, why this matters is that right now, for example, we have existing prognos prognostic factors for patients where we might be able to tell them that they have a 20% chance of recurrence in five years. However, it's possible that two out of these 10 patients, for example, might have high levels of CTCs and DTCs, and this may allow us to stratify them into a separate group and give them a higher risk for recurrence, whereas the others who have low CTCs and DTCs may be able to be categorized into a lower category of risk. So this is kind of the overarching goal of why we are interested in these cells. So how did the tipping trial and micromet studies work? Well, patients were enrolled onto the trial, and then eventually, um, the, if they had neoadjuvant therapy, they would complete neoadjuvant therapy first, and then we would collect CTCs and DTCs from them through their peripheral blood or bone marrow. Alternatively, if they were going to go through adjuvant treatment, then we would collect them before they uh, had systemic therapy. So these are kind of the two different types of patients that were on the trial um, in a general sense. So what kind of patients did we end up having on this trial? Well, we had we were able to evaluate 1,084 patients for the analysis, and this is the breakdown of what stages they were. So primarily, we had stage one and stage two breast cancer patients, but we did have some DCIS, stage three, and other patients who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy that had no residual disease when we took their CTCs and DTCs. Um, we, the distribution between adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy was about 65% uh, on adjuvant and the rest on adjuvant therapy, or neoadjuvant therapy. At this point, 16.2% um, of the patients have had a breast cancer relapse, 11.8% um, distant relapse, and 8% about who have passed away from breast cancer. So as a result of our measurements, uh, we were able to get information for CTCs on 980 patients, and the median was zero cells per milliliter. And so the team decided that this was going to be used as the cutoff value, so any patient that had higher than zero cells per, per milliliter was considered to have a high level of CTCs. And similarly, with DTCs, uh, the study team decided for this analysis that the 75th percentile was the cutoff, and that would be the 16.68 cells per milliliter. And to understand why we can't just use zero cells per milliliter as the cutoff, it's because that some, based on the sensitivity of these assays, it's possible that even nor healthy patients will t technically have some detectable, what they call DTCs in their, in their system. So it's not just a clear cut zero uh, for all healthy patients and, and you know, that you'd have at least one if you have breast cancer. So uh, our statistician, Linda Lindstrom, uh, did the statistical analysis for us. Um, and this, she performed the statistics uh, doing the Cox analysis. And so for those of you who don't know what the Cox analysis does, you just really have to understand um, two things, and that's the hazard ratio and the parameter that we're measuring. So the hazard ratio basically tells you um, how much more likely a patient who is positive for the parameter is to experience a particular event. In this case, I'll go with what's highlighted, and that is the distant, distant relapse. So in the highlighted uh, row, if a patient has greater than zero cells per milliliter, then they are determined to have 1.53 higher chance of developing a distant relapse compared to a patient that has uh, less than zero cells per milliliter, so essentially no cells. Um, and so what this tells us, this is the only one that was statistically significant based on our analysis, is that um, out of all these analyses, if you have a high level of CTCs defined as anything greater than zero, then you would be at a higher risk of developing a distant recurrence but that there was no other statistically significant finding from the others, uh, which was the breast cancer specific death um, for CTCs and DTCs. Um, this was conducted on a five-year analysis, and so as we move forward, we may be able to adjust this data um, as we get more and more information. But I want to kind of highlight the limitations of this current analysis. So this was performed on the entire group of patients that we had and we grouped all of them together and performed this analysis. Unfortunately, at this point, it's very possible that we need to separate the patients into two separate groups because, as you remember, we collected CTCs and DTCs from these patients at two different points in their treatment. So neoadjuvant patients and adjuvant patients may have very different results because, if you can imagine, a neoadjuvant <coughs> patient has already had systemic therapy before we collected their CTCs and DTCs. So potentially, their cutoff value, or what we determined to be positive or high for CTCs and DTCs would be different for them compared to patients who had uh, adjuvant therapy in which we would collect these cells from them before they have systemic therapy. Um, so we 
moving forward, we will hopefully be able to separate these two patients out, uh, two populations, and perform the analysis on these two groups. Um, furthermore, we, the cutoffs that we're using right now are 0 and 16.68. And there's been some discussion about using different cutoff values because at this point, the 75th percentile is an arbitrary cutoff that we used. Um, there are other studies out there that use different cutoff values, and it's important for us to look at um, controls and seeing what we can possibly use as, as a different cutoff, especially for the DTCs. So in conclusion, at this point, we can't really conclude on whether or not the CTCs and DTCs from this study showed any specific uh, prognostic uh, relation to outcome. Because we may need to be redoing the statistical analysis and to, to show more of the actual um, accurate uh, populations by splitting up the patients into two new adjuvant and adjuvant groups. Additionally, we want to look at using um, different groups of populations such as ER positive and triple negative patients because it's possible that these patients, uh, certain only certain groups of populations will have some form of statistical significance with CTCs and DTCs. Um, so in conclusion, hopefully we'll, we'll be moving forward and analyzing this data in the coming Yes, yeah, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Annie. I think a really um, important lesson that I learned this year is just so much about breast cancer. I think every time I was out in the world talking with friends or meeting new people and I told them I work at the breast care center here, they always wanted to share a story about, you know, my mother had breast cancer or I had a friend or a sister. Um, you know, it's a prevalent disease so I feel really fortunate to, you know, be more informed um, for myself and then for all you other lovely ladies. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> like uh, Dr. Esserman said, I work this year in the Athena Program Management Office to help support a number of research initiatives um, there. And our next really big initiative is a personalized breast cancer screening trial. And for my final project, I worked with Celia Kaplan, um, who I don't think could be here today, but um, she helped me develop a survey that we sent out to Athena participants um, to help inform the development of this personalized screening trial. I'll start off with a brief background about the current mammogram debate and then summarize the personalized screening trial, particularly the design. There are a lot of details around the trial, so I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, then I'll discuss the survey, really where it comes in, and look at results and some of our next steps. So breast cancer screening in the U.S. today is mired in controversy. A lot of uh, studies and stories have come out in the news recently. It saves lives, it doesn't. Experts really do not agree at this point. We have conflicting recommendations from different organizations. So the American Cancer Society recommends annual screening at age 40, while the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends biennial screening beginning at age 50, um, plus or minus. So with regular screening on the population level, we are faced with a number of unintended consequences. These include false positives. I believe it's around something like 600,000 breast biopsies um, are benign every year, as well as overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Needless to say, mammography practice is very expensive. It's estimated that it costs 8 to $10 billion every year. And in the end, it's women who are really caught in the middle asking themselves whether to screen or not to screen. Um, so this is an issue that affects all of us. Um, for the women in the room, this may be a decision you're making for yourself now, or maybe it's a decision you'll make for yourselves in the future. Um, and then for the men in the room, not to leave you out, this is going to be all the women in your lives. <laughs> so, I stole this slide from Dr. Esserman. Um, you know, this information is really showing us that one size does not fit all. And Athena is really asking, how can we do better? How can we personalize breast cancer screening so that we more effectively reach those women who are at high risk while reducing some of those unintended consequences for women at low risk? So Athena today is...
is already working toward personalizing breast cancer care, screening prevention and treatment. Today we're talking about screening. So currently, the way it works is a woman will schedule her mammogram at a UC Medical Center. This triggers her Athena Health Questionnaire be sent to her home. She can also fill it out in clinic with an iPad. And that information goes into a risk calculator. This generates a risk profile, which goes back to the woman, her doctor, and also into our database for research. In the instance that a woman is uh, deemed at elevated risk, she will be referred to an Athena Breast Health Specialist who consults her on preventative measures such as lifestyle changes, um, exercise, alcohol reduction, um, <laughs> genetic testing if appropriate based on her family history, and uh, potentially clinical uh, interventions. Um, where is Athena going? So Athena 2.0 is kind of how we've uh, deemed it. Um, the, the idea is to really leverage the current in, uh, Athena infrastructure that's in place to really raise the bar on personalized breast cancer risk assessment. And I'll show you what that will look like in just a few slides. Um, and, and, and to tailor screening to an individual's risk profile. And we are proposing to do this in a trial setting to compare this personalized approach to uh, usual care, how mammography is practiced today. Okay, this is our study design. Um, essentially, eligible women will be approached to participate in the study, and if they first consent to data, data collection, so essentially uh, consenting to Athena 1.0, they will then be given the opportunity to state a preference. So at Athena, we felt it was very important that women still had a choice in this matter. Um, you know, if they wanted to opt in to personalize screening to be able to have that option. So if they do not have a preference or if they are willing to be randomized, because we would really um, you know, like to have a significant number of women be randomized, then they will be assigned into either the personalized screening group um, or the usual care group. So this study design was submitted uh, as an LOI to PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, this spring. And really exciting that we were accepted and invited to submit a full proposal that's due in the beginning of August. So Athena's really working in overdrive um, to think this through and put together a really strong proposal. Okay, so this is what the personalized screening arm would look like. As before, the woman will fill out an Athena Health Questionnaire. She will also receive a mammogram to determine her breast density and undergo a genetic test that will include SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. This will go into a risk calculator, and depending on her um, projected risk for developing breast cancer, that woman may be recommended to screen once every six months, annually, biennially, or perhaps not screened at all. And it's important to note that there's um, n nothing too too much here because all of these screening recommendations still fall within the US PSTF guidelines. This is our um, risk-based screening model. It's still being refined, so don't worry too much about the numbers um, inside, but you can see that based on a woman's age and her risk level, um, she will be then accordingly assigned. <coughs> When we were developing this study design, a lot of questions came up. Personalized screening in and of itself is very novel. And in addition, this sort of trial is very novel. For example, we don't know how many women would be willing to be randomized in a trial such as this. We really don't know how many women would state a preference and if they did, what, what group they would choose. And in addition, we didn't know how comfortable women would be receiving a genetic test in, in the screening setting. So these effectively served as, as the research questions for the survey study. <clears throat> so we wanted to hear directly from the women that we are going to be approaching to, to um, participate in this trial. So we used the existing Athena Health Questionnaire system we, to um, send a survey, it was 10 questions, 
<coughs> women would receive an email like this inviting them to participate that effectively served as our consent form and they could click the link to be directed to the online survey. We sent it to 500 women and it went out on June 15th. So like I said, we've kind of been working in a very short timeline here. So we were really excited to get 224 responses within two weeks and actually 130 of those within 24 hours. So in the interest of time, I'll just go over some of the very preliminary counts for just three questions. What did we learn? So we learned that 42% of women would be very likely to participate if randomized, um, and another 24% reported that they would be somewhat likely. So this is encouraging. We also learned that 46% of women, um, if stated a preference, would prefer the personalized screening group, and 28 the annual screening group, and then another quarter did not state a preference or did not know. When asked how comfortable women would be receiving the genetic test, uh, we were very happy to see that 82% said they would be very comfortable, and another 12 said somewhat comfortable. So this very preliminary data suggests that women are very interested in this issue. Um, just some highlights from the data, 66% said they would likely uh, participate if randomized. Only 3% said they did not want to participate at all. And 94% say they would be comfortable receiving that genetic test. So this really speaks in favor of Athena's study and Athena's study design. So some next steps. Um, we're working currently to describe our sample demographically. We are also doing some more refined statistics and some subgroup analyses. We're writing this up for our PCORI grant proposal, um, just as <coughs> preliminary data to show that women are really invested. Um, PCORI is patient-centered, so they want to um, you know, make sure that we're considering the patient's perspective here. Um, it can help us project enrollment numbers, and we're going to continue research um, by potentially expanding our respondent demographics, sending the survey out to more people, um, and, and doing focus groups and interviews. So that's it. We have these conflicting recommendations. Athena's proposing this trial to really let this issue have its day in court. And then my survey study was um, aimed at understanding women's preferences around launching a trial such as this. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Robin Chin, and I've had the pleasure of working on two teams this year at the Breast Care Center, um, one at the iSpy Lab under Dr. Laura Vantveer, and then within the Plastics Department, mostly working with Dr. Frederick Wang. So today I want to be talking about um, evaluating our need for the use of prolonged post-operative antibiotic prophylaxis in the setting of tissue expander-based reconstruction after mastectomy. Before we delve into that really long topic title, um, I want to just go over briefly what I'll be talking about. Um, we'll just do a quick background into prophylaxis and what we know, and then we'll be talking about um, the literature review that I ran investigating the use of postoperative prophylaxis in the fields of breast and other similar surgical categories. Um, we'll finish up with a talk about the concerns with overuse of antibiotics in prophylaxis and then a trial design that um, Dr. Wang, Dr. Esterman, and I developed over the last month. So just to give you an idea, um, tissue expander followed by implant-based reconstruction um, composes about 80% of all reconstruction after breast mastectomy. Now, normally complication rates are quite low, but we have um, an estimated 2 to 15% infection rates across all institutions. And simply put, an infection in after breast reconstruction can be catastrophic, resulting most frequently in readmission for IV antibiotics, followed by the potential for a loss of implant or tissue expander, um, a compromised overall cosmetic outcome, and then uh, potentially the delay of life-saving adjuvant treatment. So what we want to do is avoid, at all costs, the chance of developing an infection within this group. And uh, one of our main techniques we use to reduce the risk of infection is the application of um, prophylactic antibiotics, or the use of any antibiotics prior to any clinical evidence of infection. So typically, prophylaxis is applied just prior to exposure, so usually within 60 minutes, right before the initial incision in the operating room. Um, however, the duration can vary. So at minimum, um, a typical prophylaxis regimen will consist of a perioperative 
uh, regimen just prior to the incision throughout the operation and then just immediately after. But some of the regimens can extend much longer, so um, typically anywhere from IV to oral antibiotics taken during the recovery period. Now what regimens do we have evidence for? Um, really right now, we only have evidence for the use of perioperative prophylaxis. Um, there is a lot of strong literature indicating that the use of perioperative prophylaxis significantly reduces the risk of infection to our patients. But here at the Breast Care Center, we use um, a slightly more aggressive approach to prophylaxis. We administer the perioperative IV antibiotics just prior to incision, followed by the mastectomy, the placement of the tissue expander, and the surgical drains. And then we send home our patients with a course of oral antibiotics to be taken twice daily at home until their surgical drains have been removed here in clinic, which is usually an average of two weeks, but could take more or less time depending on um, the fluid draining. So like I said, um, we do have significant evidence to argue for in support of perioperative prophylaxis, but right now we just don't really have the evidence to confirm whether or not there's a benefit to that prolonged postoperative regimen. And if there is a benefit, we don't really know what the ideal duration might be. Should they be taken until the drains are removed or longer or less time? We don't really know. So in 2003, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare um, established what's called the Surgical Care Improvement Project, um, intent on reducing the morbidity and mortality for surgical procedures. And of particular interest to us are their recommendations on antibiotic dosing. SCIP recommends one perioperative dose just prior to exposure and then cessation of all perioperative prophylaxis at the 24-hour postoperative mark. Now a number of fields have adopted this uh, recommendation and um, seen no change in their surgical site infection rates. However, breast reconstruction remains somewhat of an outlier in that we're still, uh, the majority of breast and plastic surgeons are prescribing that prolonged regimen much longer than that 24-hour cessation mark. And there's quite a bit of good reason behind this, this choice. Uh, many believe that breast reconstruction is a, an inherently risky procedure and prone to infection because of a number of risk factors. Um, one, you're implanting a prosthetic device already known to be risky for infection, and you're placing it in a devascularized um, breast pocket that, where most of the surrounding tissue has been removed, and it is believed that blood isn't perfusing quite as well as it should be. Um, you also have the presence of surgical drains, one or more basically open entry sites for potential contamination during the recovery period. And then lastly, a number of our patients have had a history of chemotherapy, radiation, or a number of past surgical procedures, all putting them at an elevated risk for developing an infection. So because of all these reasons, most surgeons continue to prescribe that longer course of antibiotics after surgery. Okay, so what I did here was I wanted to conduct a literature review examining the evidence for that longer regimen, and um, I wanted to look both in breasts but also a few other um, surgical specialties. So what I did was I conducted a literature review looking specifically for studies that examined the evidence um, for postoperative prophylaxis, um, both in breast, um, spinal instrumented procedures, and total joint replacement. And these three categories were selected because they all share the placement of a prosthetic with um, surgical drains. So they have somewhat similar risk factors for infection. So going into orthopedics first, I um, found five uh, instrumented spinal randomized controlled trials and uh, six total joint replacement trials examining the benefit of postoperative prolonged prophylaxis. But from all this literature, there was no, um, no added benefit to prolonged postoperative prophylaxis um, in in uh, the orthopedic fields, and we can see that here. So here on the x-axis, we have odds ratios. Um, this is specifically for the spinal instrumented studies, and um, as you can tell, if the confidence intervals fall below one, that indicates that a prolonged regimen <coughs> is superior, and if they fall above one, that indicates that a shorter um, prophylactic regimen stopping at 24 hours postoperatively is superior. But all the confidence intervals here cross one, which indicates a null result, meaning that neither prophylactic regimen was superior to the other. The same is true for total joint replacement. In all of these studies, um, no benefit was found to either regimen, indicating that they both have equal rates of surgical site infection. So for breast literature, um, the evidence is a lot less clear. There are currently no randomized controlled trials published to date, and I was only able to find four retrospective studies examining the benefit of postoperative prolonged prophylaxis. 
Now, unfortunately, a number of these studies um, involve small patient populations and a mixed um, procedure set. So we're really interested in tissue expander-based reconstruction, but a number of these also included all or any surgical procedures done on the axillary site or the breast. Um, two studies found an added benefit to a prolonged regimen, but two did not. So what we really have to uh, come to a conclusion here is that just the data really isn't there for us to determine definitively whether or not that prolonged regimen is worthwhile. Um, so you might be wondering at this point in time, you know, I did mention that an infection is quite catastrophic, so why are we so concerned with minimizing our use of prophylactic antibiotics? And as you are all familiar with, and I'm sure you know, um, the overuse of antibiotics has been linked to a growing resistance in bacteria populations. But the problem with that, um, that idea is that it's rather abstract, and um, you're sort of comparing a risk to society versus a risk to your individual patient. And so the natural inclination is to prescribe a longer course of antibiotics because you're more concerned with whether or not this patient is going to be losing her implant or not. But what I really want to do is actually um, turn that sort of abstract concept on its head and say that there is an indication that the overuse of antibiotics could potentially lead to a worse outcome in an individual patient at our clinic. And the, the way we think about this is going back to one of the risk factors that I mentioned earlier, the devascularized pocket that we're implanting a prosthetic device in. So the idea behind this, and some, of, some argue that um, within that devascularized pocket, once you're sending patients home on oral antibiotics, they're actually receiving a suboptimal dose of um, oral antibiotics, which could actually select for more resistant bacteria within that breast pocket. And therefore, what we're doing is once the patient comes off uh, prophylaxis, um, she might later develop an infection later on down the line that is actually worse than it would have been had we not been prescribing that longer course. So what we really have here are two camps, um, one which argues that the use of a prolonged regimen is beneficial in reducing the risk of infection. And another which argues that actually the dosing that we're giving is suboptimal to the point that we might actually be increasing resistance and causing worse infections later on down the line. Unfortunately, the evidence just really isn't there to argue one way or the other. So Dr. Wang, um, Dr. Esterman and I have been working on a randomized placebo-controlled trial to investigate this question, asking whether or not a shorter course of antibiotics ceased at 24 hours um, could produce uh, rates of infection similar to that that we see with our longer standard of care um, prolonged postoperative dose. So that would be a non-inferiority study, but we wanted to take it one step further and ask, um, could actually a shorter course of antibiotics be superior in, um, in the fact that once an infection does develop, we're better able to manage it with IV antibiotics and therefore increase what is called our salvage rates or um, the avoidance of having to return to the operating room and replace that implant later on. So tentatively, we hypothesize that serious infection rates will remain similar um, among both uh, cohorts for both antibiotic regimens, but that if we do see any change, it'll be only in those minor infections that are able to be managed with oral antibiotics at home, and that our salvage rates for implants will um, increase and implant loss rates will decrease on a shorter course of antibiotics. So that's basically um, the, the bare bones of this trial design and Dominic will be taking over for me in the plastics team so I hope you get to see this to fruition, um, take it from a conceptual to a, an actuality. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone I've worked with this year. Um, Julia and Janice, I forgot to include you on the slide but you are not to be forgotten. Um, thank you so much, they've been my managers this year. Um, and I think that's it. Any questions? Hi everyone, I'm Karen and my projects this year have been very varied, which I love. Um, I've been working obviously on decision services with all the other interns. Um, I've been working also in the lab on a, diff a lot of different genetic projects and also with Dr. Chen on some fertility studies. Um, and I think one of the biggest things I learned this year is how important it is ha to have a great mentor. And there are so many mentors here at um, UCSF, so the new interns really you know, take advantage of getting to know everybody because they can teach you so much. Um, so my final project has been I'm working on developing a predictive blood gene expression signature for early onset breast cancer. And I wanted to start off by um, defining what early onset breast cancer is. 
So this statistic you'll hear everywhere from in the clinic and also in research that one in eight women will develop breast cancer sometime in her lifetime. So this means that an average woman walking down the street will have about a 12% risk of developing breast cancer sometime in her life. So there's a smaller subgroup of women, one in 12, that will develop breast cancer before the age of 40. And this is what we define as being diagnosed with early onset breast cancer. Um, and these women are more likely to die from their disease stage by stage. So why do these women have a higher risk um, of, from their disease? There are a couple different reasons, and Annie touched on this um, uh, talking about screening. So current screening strategies aren't routinely recommended for women before the age of 40. And also these younger women tend to have denser breasts, so it might be a little harder to distinguish tumor tissue from normal breast tissue. Another re reason these women are, are, are at higher risk is because their disease tends to be more aggressive. So triple negative tumors are more prevalent in younger women. Um, also, younger women tend to develop more interval cancers, so cancers that grow so rapidly that they develop between screening intervals. Um, and the third reason why these women are at higher risk um, is because since they develop cancer so early on, there's probably more a uh, higher likelihood that they inherited some sort of genetic predisposition towards um, developing can sorry, cancer. <laughs> so taking all of these factors together, you can see that there is a need um, for a better way to identify women that are at high risk for developing cancer earlier on. And that's the aim of our project, to fill this need for a better, um, more effective screening. And our method was to develop a predict predictive test um, using gene expression signature. Um, so currently, also Annie talked about this a little bit, but um, the current risk assessment models to determine whether a woman is at higher risk for developing breast cancer are more history-based and DNA-based. Um, so things like the Gale model looks at a woman's personal history. So um, when, their, when was their age, when they first got their period, how many children have they had, also um, how many past breast biopsies did they have. Um, the Tyra Cusick model looks into family history to see if a woman's a mother, grandmother, or aunt had breast cancer, and looking at their history, they determine if a woman is at higher risk for de developing breast cancer. If a clinician deems a woman at high risk, usually they're referred to a geneticist and to send out for more DNA-based tests, so the mo most popular is the BRCA mutation test. Um, there's also been development of panels um, to look into mutations of single genes, such as P10 or P53. But even with all these tests, there are still women that aren't deemed high risk that do develop breast cancer earlier on at an early age. So we were thinking of looking into gene expression as a model for a risk assessment test. So what I mean by gene expression is mRNA and microRNA um, levels in a woman. So an RNA-based model is more downstream of DNA-based models. So it not only looks at single genes and mutations in single genes such as BRCA, but it looks at how different genes interact with each other and also the environment. So we think that um, RNA-based tests would be a good way to um, describe the complexity of cancer and it could contribute to the current risk models that we have today. Um, so the perfect model to build our gene expression signature on would be normal breast tissue. But for practicality reasons, we used um, blood samples instead. So the first step in creating a gene expression signature is to, um, would be to collect blood samples from breast cancer patients and non-breast cancer patients. So this was our discovery cohort. Um, we were able to recruit about 101 patients from UCSF. Um, our cases, so women were diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 45. They were BRCA negative and coming to UCSF for their treatment, but we collected their blood um, at least six months after their treatment and, di um, and they were disease free. Um, our 50 age match controls were women coming to UCSF for their screening mammograms. So these women were disease free. Um, they had no family or personal history of breast cancer. So the next step in determining a gene expression signature is to de determine gene expression profiles for each of these samples. So um, looking at the mRNA levels and also the expression in each of these samples. 
So to do this, um, we isolated the Buffy coat from the blood samples. Um, we extracted the total RNA, so total RNA is mRNA and also microRNA from these samples um, using a triazole extraction method. And we ran um, our samples on an FMetrix whole transcript array to determine profiles for each of these patients. Um, so the next step after we get our gene expression profiles is to develop our signature finally. Um, so to do this simply is to look at um, our cases versus our controls. So to look at the gene expression profiles of women that had breast cancer versus women that didn't have breast cancer and to see if there's any sort of significant way and different genes that could predict which samples these were. Um, so with the, hape, with the help of David Quigley, he is a bio bioinformatics statistician in the Balmain lab, we developed a 35 gene expression signature. So um, he, what he did was he wrote an algorithm that produced a set of genes and also a set of rules that was able to accurately predict if a sample was uh, from a woman that had breast cancer versus a woman that didn't have breast cancer. And you don't have to look at this, but I just wanted to uh, point out a couple of different genes that um, was in our signature. Um, there's a lot of genes involved in the immune system and specifically the inflammatory response. And our signature through the ROC curve, um, we can see that it's about 73% accurate in predicting whether a sample was from a woman with breast cancer or from a woman that didn't have breast cancer. So the next step in developing a gene expression signature is to make sure that it works in all different groups. So not just work, it, it doesn't just accurately predict um, a case versus a control in the population that we developed it on, but in any different population. Um, so we are lucky enough to work with the Blood Systems Research Institute. Um, they have access to a really unique a set of samples. So these blood samples are actually from women um, before they develop breast cancer. So they donated their blood um, and then linked to the California um, Cancer Registry. We can see which ones um, developed breast cancer later on and which didn't. Um, so from the Galper repository, we have about 33 early onset cases and controls. Last week, we just finished um, processing the samples, extracting all the mRNA so they're ready to go. But we also um, were notified that there's another Red Cross repository that has an additional 78 samples and controls. So overall, we'll have about 111 cases and 111 controls. Um, so the next step would be to finish processing these samples and to run it on our nanostring um, mRNA expression platform and to see if our signature really does validate on these samples. Um, so once, hopefully, if it's validated, we can use this as a more predictive test for um, risk stratifying women. And once these women are risk stratified and women that are deemed at high risk, we could recommend increased screening. Um, screening for high-risk women, and we can also maybe suggest chemo prevention interventions. Um, and looking at our gene list, it could drive research in um, future targeted interventions as well. Thanks. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tim Henderson. Um, as far as what I've learned this year, I think the two most important things are listen to everyone all the time because you never know what little piece of knowledge you'll pick up along the way that proves to be really important and use your resources. They're here, everyone in this room is here for you and they're just a wealth of knowledge and ideas. So at UCSF I work specifically on the Athena site team and I work on Athena accrual and standard of care in the BCC. I'm also the coordinator for Alyssa Ozan's study investigating the feasibility of implementing the NCCN breast and ovarian cancer screening guidelines in clinical practice. I'm the coordinator for the post mastectomy radiation registry with Dr. Faubel. I work on the survivorship retreat with Debbie Hamalski. And as an intern, I, of course, perform decision, ser decision services. And today, I'd like to make a proposal for extending decision services to the same day assessment clinic. So this whole thing started with Ron Balasanian and an observational pilot 
uh, project for a program he was calling Ask Your Pathologist, which in conjunction with Jeff Belcora, he had been developing as a way of potentially extending decision services to the FNA clinic. The thinking being that patients would benefit from reviewing their pathology slides and report with a pathologist after their FNA biopsy and having an intern there to perform decision, decision services during that appointment. So that would include the question listing and note taking and audio recording that we currently do in the BCC. And so in order to help decide if such a program would be feasible and useful, I conducted a needs assessment in the FNA clinic. I assisted and observed with over 35 biopsies and engaged in discovery-driven planning and formative evaluation, which essentially meant that I went into the project with no preconceived idea of what the final outcome would be and kept my mind open along the way. And so the question I was really trying to answer was, where's the need? Or put more succinctly, where's this need sweet spot? How do I, <laughs> how do I satisfy the needs of the four principal stakeholders in the situation? Would patients benefit from having an intern present during their biopsy and then reviewing their, reviewing their pathology with a pathologist? Would the pathologist benefit from that process? Would the interns benefit? And would this be a good use of the internship program's relatively limited resources? And so in investigating all of those questions, it turned out that the need wasn't exactly where I thought it would be. Just some quick numbers for you. You can see the majority of patients arrived either visibly anxious or said they were nervous prior to their biopsy. There were very few who had a confirmed diagnosis before their FNA. And then there was about a 50-50 split between patients who, were, who had a benign diagnosis by FNA and then those who had either a malignant or a potentially malignant diagnosis pending further laboratory testing. And so the benign patients they were told on the spot by the pathologist that whatever was biopsied was benign and they left the clinic that day happy, relieved, and really wouldn't have benefited from reviewing their pathology in the future. But then the second group, the group comprised of those with either a malignant diagnosis or a potentially malignant diagnosis, might benefit from some sort of decision services. And that was the group that I really wanted to target, those patients with a possible or preliminary cancer diagnosis. They were often highly anxious. They were typically waiting for either results to come back from the FNA or from another diagnostic test, or were waiting to have another diagnostic procedure. And many of them were completely unprepared for this new situation. They walked into the hospital that day, probably not thinking they would ever have cancer, and were about to find out that they likely did. And so I ran these thoughts and observations by Dr. Esserman, and she suggested that I go speak to Susie Eater, because a lot of these types of patients come from the lump and bump or the same day assessment clinic. Mm -hmm. So being a good intern, I took that suggestion or uh, order and <laughs> went and spoke to Susie. <laughs> and so I spoke to Susie and I asked her, how does the same day clinic work? What would make it run more smoothly, and where did she think the need was? So here we have a diagram of the same day workflow. Patients typically come to the clinic with some sort of abnormal outside imaging. They often need an, addis an additional diagnostic procedure. So on that same day that, that they have their first appointment with Susie, they're sent for this procedure, be it an FNA or an ultrasound or a mammogram. The patients then return to the breast care center and wait for either Susie or another provider to become available for the results of those tests to be communicated back to the BCC. And then they have a second appointment on the same day in which the results of the tests are discussed and if cancer is indicated, the uh, new situation, possible treatment options, and additional diagnostic information is discussed. And so throughout this whole process, there are a number of barriers. The first being that high patient anxiety. As I'm sure many of you have noticed, and as I noted in the FNA clinic, the minute a patient is sent for a diagnostic procedure, their anxiety skyrockets if it wasn't already really high to begin with. And then during that whole process of getting from one clinic to another, back to the first, waiting for the test results, getting the actual procedure, there are a number of small logistical barriers that arise, and those are very unnerving for patients. Additionally, 
the coordination of care and communication between clinics, between patients and providers, between providers, could be better. And if that coordination and communication were improved, it's possible that patient wait times upon returning to the breast care center could be diminished. And then finally, Susie mentioned to me that when she gives patients a cancer diagnosis, understandably, it's like their brains just shut off after that, and they can't remember what they were told. They have, a di they have difficulty absorbing that new information. And then they go home, and they start speaking with their family members or thinking back over what happened, and they realize they have no idea what happened. So how do we improve? I propose having an on-call patient liaison. This person or persons would be on call during the same day assessment clinic to facilitate the coordination of care by shepherding patients from the BCC to the diagnostic procedures and back. They would also help patients overcome those small barriers along the way. And they would act as a communication conduit between clinics and between the patient and the clinics. And this could be something as simple as letting Susie know when a patient has returned to the breast care center waiting room and is ready to be seen, or helping ensure that the uh, test results are communicated quickly and, and accurately. The liaison would also perform impromptu decision services, especially in the case that Susie or another provider is giving a cancer diagnosis. And this would be much the same as, as decision services as we currently perform it note-taking and audio recording during an appointment, and then a provision of copy, copies of both of those to the patient. That way, when she goes home, she has a record of what happened and doesn't need to try to remember what was discussed. And then finally, we could send decision aids and background educational materials to patients after their appointments. These would be the same DAs and educational materials that we currently use, but in this instance, it would help decrease patient anxiety by increasing their knowledge about their new situation, their potential treatment options, and would help put patients in the best possible situation to make an informed decision about their potential treatment. So the next obvious question is, who will do this? <laughs> this is a labor-intensive process. And so my first thought was, well, the interns will do it. We already do decision services, we work in the breast care center, this is just an extension of what we're already doing. But the interns are already stretched pretty thin, doing all the great work you've seen today, working on a range of projects, performing decision services in its current incarnation. So Jeff Belcora and Shelley Volt suggested that perhaps the patient support core would be a better solution. This is a group of Berkeley undergraduates who are trained in decision services and perform those services in a wide range of clinics at UCSF. This program would help them gain more patient contact, deepen their understanding of how care works at the UCSF Breast Care Center, and make an actual tangible difference in the functioning of our clinics. And given the relatively limited resources that we're working with, I think having the patient support core act as the on-call patient liaisons is the best solution for providing decision services to a group of patients that we're currently missing. So I'd like to thank the following people, especially Ron Balasanian and the other pathologists in the FNA clinic. And thank you all for listening. And without further ado, Elizabeth will tell us about how to make sure your hair stays on your head during chemo. Yes. Hopefully. First, I will tell you about my, <laughs> the thing that I will take away, well, I'll take away many things, but um, I was just thinking that part of my job, not necessarily so much in this study, but in another study that I coordinated um, over the year, is thinking about when you go into a patient room for the first time and you're going to consent a patient, just taking a moment to meet them where they're at. So a lot of times as a coordinator, you get a page it's from Dr. Rugo. You need, to, you need to go consent this patient in an exam room. And you don't really know how much, um, how long they've waited already, where they're at in terms of their knowledge of the study. So I think it's just a good thing to think about before you enter a patient room. You, know, you don't know where they're at. You don't know what they know. And if they're not ready to absorb the information, like Tim is saying, it's probably a good idea to meet them where they're at at that point and then suggest you talk on the phone later and consent them at a different time. It's probably better for the patients overall. 
But um, okay, so today one of the studies that I coordinated over the last year is the Penguin Cold Cap Registry Study. Um, and so let's just take a moment and imagine that we're in the grocery store or we're waiting in line um, for the movies and we're looking around and we see her. So, you know, within the context of the breast care center or if you're up in the infusion, this is actually a very common sight. And I've had a lot of women tell me that they're more likely to not bring their wig to meet with a physician um, because everyone here sort of understands what's, what's happening. But when you're in the grocery store and you see this woman, she's going to stand out. Um, and, you know, the reason she's standing out is because we've made some assumptions about her. And one of the biggest assumptions we've made is that she's sick, um, she has cancer, and you know, she's probably receiving chemotherapy. So actually, in the last decade, the management of chemotherapy-related side effects has become much better. We're much better at controlling nausea, fatigue, a variety of um, chemotherapy-related side effects. But one of them, one of the side effects that really continues to be very distressing for many patients is this concept of chemotherapy-induced alopecia, so hair loss as a result of the chemotherapy regimen that the patient is assigned. And specifically in breast cancer research, this is actually well studied and well documented. Women who are experiencing chemotherapy-induced alopecia tend to have more depression, tend to sort of report having a more negative body image. And then thinking back to the woman we saw in the grocery store, a lot of times women report that they feel a loss of privacy as a result of the chemotherapy-induced alopecia, and that um, you know, as a result, they might actually go ahead and limit their daily activities because of this. So it's not to say that every woman who is confronted, you know, with the fact that they need to initiate chemotherapy is worried necessarily about losing their hair. This is, it's, it's something that's out there in our society and people see it and people accept it and it's okay. But for women who are really anxious about it, are there options? Um, is there something that we can do to be sort of either preventing chemotherapy-induced alopecia or at least reducing the amount of hair loss that a patient um, can expect during chemotherapy? So the answer is yes. And, um, <laughs> and the main way people go about doing that is through scalp cooling right now. So there are a, a variety of different techniques, and people have been trying different techniques since the 1970s. The theories behind scalp cooling aren't um, necessarily definitive, but the general idea is that when you put a frozen something on your head, <laughs> you're reducing the temperature at the scalp level. And when you have chemotherapy in your bloodstream, so this is taking place you know, during an infusion, chemotherapy is coming into your bloodstream, if you're reducing um, the sort of blood flow at that area, you are minimizing or at least reducing the amount of chemotherapy that's being delivered. So you're less likely to lose hair or less likely to lose all your hair, which is the case for many, many drug regimens. So here at UCSF, we use penguin cold caps. And by we, I mean penguin cold caps are not actually FDA approved, um, but they are one of the most common, if not the most common, scalp cooling technique used in the United States currently. So they were introduced in 1994, but because of um, a variety of issues, which I'll get to, they're not FDA approved and they're not even in an FDA uh, trial. So it's unclear if they will ever be approved. Part of the reason for that is when a patient decides to use the cold caps, what she's actually doing is renting about 14 different caps because these caps aren't attached to any type of system that can regulate the temperature. So instead, the patient has 14 different caps, they're being kept in a freezer, and every 20 to 30 minutes, we're rotating these caps so that you're not you know, dealing with something like a thawing effect where there's so much variability in the scalp temperature, chemo's getting there anyways. That wouldn't be very effective. Um, I was gonna bring a cold cap, but I forgot. So the idea is, which we can see here, this <laughs> we'll see, is that basically you flatten it out and someone attaches it to your head. So I'll get into that later, but that's the general look. So in 2010, Laura Esserman, Michelle Malisco, Dr. Rugo, um, and some of the other medical oncologists decided that we should open up a registry study to sort of track how many patients are interested in using the cold caps, actually go through with it, um, 
but almost more importantly, assess, depending on the drug regimen that the patients are assigned, how effective these cold caps actually are. So um, before I get into the challenges, I'll just say that participating in a registry study, especially one like this, is in terms of eligibility requirements, pretty simple. You have a diagnosis of breast cancer and you've been assigned, and this is important, you are assigned to a chemotherapy regimen that is expected to induce full or at least partial alopecia. <coughs> so that's important. Um, so you want to participate, and that's great, but there are some real barriers to these cold caps. The first is the financial barrier. So this average can really range because these caps are rented on a monthly basis. So I just kind of, we're going to look at a specific drug regimen later on, and for that regimen, it's about $2,500. So you're taking that into account. Then there's the logistical support. These women are receiving chemotherapy. So it's not as if while attached to the infusion, you know, their, their pole, they're going to go to a freezer and every 20 minutes open one up, knead out the cold cap, and strap it to their own heads. That's not going to work. So instead, they really need this logistical support of someone who's physically present for the entire time, rotating these caps every 20 to 30 minutes. So now you need this major support team with you. Um, in addition to that, you need freezer access. So there are a lot of things to keep in mind and also time commitment. Within the registry study, we've set up two different evaluations to look at efficacy. And in this sense, we're looking at efficacy as hair loss. Um, so first, when the patient comes into the clinic, they are assessed by the clinician that sees them on the Dean scale, which is basically grade zero to grade four, grade four being you know, over 75% hair loss. Um, and that happens before each of the patient's chemotherapy infusions. In addition, the patients fill out their own self-assessment. And this is on sort of more of a visual analog scale where they can circle the um, number that they feel represents their current state of hair loss. In addition to hair loss, which we're going to kind of call efficacy, there's the whole question of how well do these caps, you know, how do, they, how do patients tolerate these caps? So after each cold capping session, patients are asked to fill out a symptom survey. And the three sort of questions, there are a lot of questions on the survey, but the three questions we're really going to look at today are, you know, headaches during these, this cold capping process, how cold did you feel during the cold capping process, and at this current moment, um, you know, are you satisfied with the hair texture and quality? So currently in our registry, we have 71 patients. Um, in terms of their demographics, women range in age from 29 years old to 67, um, and they're around 50 years old on average. 73% white female and 61% adjuvant treatment, meaning they've already had surgery and they're now looking toward um, what systemic treatment they're going to have. In terms of systemic treatment, we have, t we have a variety of um, regimens, but the two regimens that have the most number of participants would be the TC times 4 group and the weekly paclitaxel and the adriamycin cytoxin group. So um, because the paxotere cytoxin um, times 4 is a very common regimen within the adjuvant setting and also because it is currently um, the cohort with the most complete data set, we're going to kind of zoom in here because it's important to think about, you know, if you're a physician and a patient is coming or if you're a nurse and you're talking to someone and they're assigned this TC times 4 regimen, is it worth thinking about overlooking those serious barriers and moving forward with purchasing and using these cold caps in terms of efficacy and tolerability? So very quickly, <coughs> TC times 4, we have 25 patients. Demographics are very similar to the, to the overall um, group. And assessments are taking place at each of these four infusions. Efficacy within the TC times four group. So this is a graph of patient um, alopecia assessment over the four cycles. And you can see that on average, patients have lost 25% of their hair. You can also see that between cycle one and cycle two, patients lose the most, uh, the majority of the hair. But it should, you should keep in mind at this point that TC times four, if you're not using scalp cooling, the expectation would be that within lead, the few days leading up to cycle two, 
the majority of your hair will fall out. So you're already probably at a grade three or grade four on that Dean scale, 50% or greater, by the time you come in for cycle two, if you're not using scalp cooling. So then when you're thinking about it like that, 25% is very good. Also good is that all 25 of these patients reported that they never felt the need to use a wig throughout these four cycles. And the other thing I'll just say, even though I'm not going to show this graph, is that the doctors um, assessed the hair loss to be very similar to the patients, so it helps with validity. Tolerability. Did patients experience headaches? Yes. Over 50% of patients experienced headaches, and they in, they, the headaches actually sort of seem to increase as the cycles go on. Um, how cold did they feel? Pretty consistently felt in a level of 40, so whatever that means. Pretty cold, though, because these are frozen caps going directly onto your head. And then overall satisfaction with hair quality and hair texture is very good. It's at 78% by cycle four, so really um, well-maintained. In terms of the follow-up satisfaction, I will say that um, I was surprised this, this number wasn't higher. It's just hard to coordinate getting these caps, renting these caps, making sure someone's with you. So 30% somewhat dissatisfied with the ease and convenience of the caps. But 72% of this cohort said that they would absolutely recommend using the cold caps to another patient who is starting TC times four. So conclusions to be made. Like we saw, you know, if you are using penguin cold caps and you're on the TC times four regimen, you could expect to lose 25% of your hair, which is actually, you know, reasonable. Um, in terms of efficacy results. And so, yeah, I think that is the takeaway. <laughs> TC times four, and you have a patient who is interested in preserving their hair and has the financial and logistical ability to do it, you should think about it. Future directions, we definitely need to look uh, further at other drug regimens that are part of this registry trial. Um, and either decide whether or not we want to directly compare them or figure out how we want to move forward in terms of creating more and more um, sort of specific recommendations to give clinicians to their patients. So, thanks. Same picture, same message. Okay, hi, I'm Buyan, and uh, I guess one of the main takeaways for me this year has been um, being kind of in tune with both the lab and with the clinic, because I'm actually going off to do an MD-PhD, so that was a very good experience for me here to work in the lab and also in the clinic and have projects in both areas as well. So um, kind of balancing that and also trying to figure out how one can really affect the other was a really good experience for me here. And I'll zip through these, so don't worry. <laughs> so these are my main projects here, and the one I'm going to be talking about is a high-risk DCIS project. And, uh, and um, it's about the tumor immune microenvironment. And we were interested in s characterizing, basically, what the tumor immune microenvironment looked like because of some of the various reasons that I will get into in the next few slides. And uh, this is another project that um, I was working in, in the Campbell Lab, where uh, we were getting blood samples from across the country and also at UCSF for a uh, clinical trial with a uh, metastatic breast cancer vaccine. And so we were staining the uh, blood samples with a variety of antibody panels. And. And then this is actually kind of associated with the high-risk CCIS project as well because um, we'll be using kind of the biomarker signature that we uh, created from the high-risk CCIS time study um, in evaluating the changes in the immune microenvironment uh, with uh, immunomodulating agents that we'll probably uh, create clinical trials for soon, I guess, not me, but Tess will. And, uh, this is also kind of related as well because we want to look at the biomarker signature of the Nigerian breast cancer uh, cases that we are collecting. Um, so Dr. Charles Adissa from Nigeria is sending us samples and the reason we're really interested in Nigerian samples or at least Western African samples is that the breast cancer there is very aggressive and um, also has early onset. 
And so a kind of mini thing that I do on the side as well is to process the blood samples from the iSpy to trial. And really it's mostly just blood fractionation and then storage for future research. Okay, some of the issues we wanted to address going into the, the high-risk CCIS study, which actually has been going on for five years now. I am the fifth intern or so who's working on it. So hopefully it will end with tests. <laughs> and um, so I we're... We're almost there. <laughs> you know we're almost there. Well, I'm sure <laughs> 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 So um, one of the main reasons that we're really interested in the immune microenvironment um, is to, I guess, we should step back and kind of think about what DCIS is. So DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, is a pre-malignant lesion. So it's not cancer, but pre-cancer. And um, there is kind of a lot of discussion about the overtreatment of DCIS because um, there is like a small percentage of a population that will progress to either invasive cancer or metastatic disease or even recur, I guess, with uh, DCIS as well, so poor prognosis. And even though it is a small percentage, people are, you know, obviously worried about it and so a lot of patients are overtreated so that they can prevent this. Also risk adverse, right? And um, another issue that we wanted to address was that there are these sinister lesions and one of them, as a lot of people mentioned, is triple negative breast cancer. And with uh, triple negative breast cancer, there are about, uh, this study actually shows there are about 10 to 20 percent of the breast cancer cases. And then um, there's also talk about how there's a lack of molecular therapies, targeted therapies. So that's something that we want to look into. And of course, the last thing was that there's poor prognosis. And another kind of sinister lesion that we're interested in is HER2 positivity, um, HER2 positive breast cancers. And um, HER2 positive breast cancers have, are kind of a high risk indicator for a lot of patients in a recurrence or progression. And that's the study. And so what we're looking into is kind of a new paradigm. And this new paradigm is looking um, at the tumor microenvironment and specifically the immune cells within the microenvironment. So of course cancer is something that comes up from your body, it's part of your cells and um, it can be caused by a variety of reasons, right? So we're looking into more of not just uh, eliminating the cancer or um, kind of killing or eradicating it, but just changing the environment, changing the ecosystem around the tumor cell and seeing if that can help us treat it or possibly um, eradicate it as well. And so the reason we're interested in the immune system is that uh, there's a lot of studies that kind of look into cancer and inflammation. So um, inflammatory kind of leukocytes or just the white cells or the immune cells around there. And so um, that's why we wanted to kind of look into the different biomarkers and see um, if there are any kind of associations between biomarkers and uh, some of the high, the clinical high risk indicators. So how are we going to do this? This is kind of a flow chart of what we did and um, I'll go through each one in the next few slides. So with the court selection, we had to do a lot of chart review to figure out which patients we really wanted to look into. And of course, we wanted to look into the high-grade DCIS cases um, that were associated with either a recurrence or um, have some of the clinical high-risk indicators. And uh, so we picked 48 of the high-grade DCIS cases. And then um, we age match these uh, patients with the low grade uh, DCIS cases. And these are some of the parameters that we use, like age, tumor size, um, the margins the, that are clear of the tumor, and also the grade necrosis, and hormone receptor status, of course, because triple negative cancers are something that we're interested in. And one of the main things that we really had to consider was the Van Nuys prognostic index. And the reason for that is uh, a lot of the samples that we used um, were within 2012 or 13, so we didn't have the five or 10 year follow up. So we're using this kind of as a surrogate for poor prognosis. And um, some of the things that you have to consider for the Van Nuys score is that um, is the tumor size, the grade, the margins, as well as the patient's age, because that can all um, contribute to what can happen later on. 
So then we went to the staining of the different tissue samples that we had. And uh, these are some of the biomarkers that we used. And most of them were uh, either T cells or macrophage uh, based. And um, we wanted to look at, uh, since we're using tissue samples on slides, spatially and also um, intensity of how many cells and um, where they are, basically. And so we used images. Of course, we imaged the slides in order to do this. And we had uh, pathologists like Alfred to mark the hot spots for us and so that we knew where to image. And uh, they, uh, using the software on the microscope, we were able to unmix these images because um, we had several colored stains on it. We had the blue stain, uh, which is the hematoxylin, to show us where the tumors are. And then we had a red stain for we um, we had uh, calibrations done to figure out, and the double stains, which one we wanted red, which one we wanted brown. So we had this multi-spectral kind of imaging that we had to do. And so we would unmix them using the software. And that way we could tell intensity-wise, you know, white to black, how intense is it, and where is it. And so um, just to show you, basically, um, if you look at the kind of the brown or reds, the macrophages are predominantly in the stroma in one of the images, whereas in another one, it is in the actual tumor region. So we were really interested in intratumoral or stromal. And one of the ways that we did it was using the cell profiler technique. And uh, we could choose which regions we wanted to really look at. For example, for here, it was within the tumor regions. And then um, we could count how many cells were there and how intense it was just in those regions, rather than doing a whole collective just image. And so finally, we analyzed the data. And uh, there's some interesting things that came out of this. So this particular um, kind of figure is showing you all the stains on the top and also all the clinical parameters. So we were correlating those two. And you see uh, the blue dots are actually um, positive. Uh, the positive correlations and the red dots are the negative correlations and the, um, the size of the dot as well as um, the color of the dot can show you like light to dark can show you um, which or, or how um, highly correlated it is and the two things are and so one of the the two kind of takeaways that we took from here is that uh, FOXP3 and um, the CDHLA-DR negative. Um, this one is uh, the inactive T cells and the FOXP3 are the presence of the T cells. Um, CD8 positive T cells are different from the FOXP3 cells, T cells. And they were, those two things are associated with uh, kind of a suppressed immune environment. And so this has been in discussion before, and we did find that around DCIS tumors as well, there is a suppressed um, immune environment. And another thing that we found was the CD1, CD115 and MAC387, which are macrophage biomarkers. These are uh, present within the tumors as well as um, just uh, on the macrophages as well. So those that aren't on the tumors as well. And so having those upregulated is another thing that is associated with a bad outcome as the Van Nuys score as was the surrogate for. And so um, from this kind of, we gathered a biomarker signature. And uh, the signature here are, you see the four stains that we were looking into, which is the CD-115, the cd hladr FOXP3, the CD-68, MAC387, and the last one, the CD4, CD20, is one that um, we want to look into because the CD, um, it will look into the T cells and B cells and where they are and what they, um, where they are and also how many of them are um, present. And so next steps is um, that tests will hopefully finish the CD4, CD20 imaging or the staining imaging and analysis. And then uh, next we really want to get into the signature for the Nigerian cases, the very aggressive, um, kind of invasive breast cancer samples that we've been getting from Nigeria. And then um, ultimately, we'll go into clinical trials uh, with various immune, um, immunomodulating agents to see what is going on before and after, if there are any changes in the immune environment and what kinds of changes there are.
and some references. And I just wanted to thank a few of my mentors. So of course the staff and um, and of course the interns. I've learned a lot from everyone, and they're such a great support group. And then of course. Uh, Shelly and Jeff were great mentors in patient advocacy and I learned a lot about how to approach patients and how to help them in ways that I couldn't as a physician I guess right now. And then of course Alfred and Rick and Mike were all great mentors for research like career decisions or even just life in general. <laughs> They're really great mentors and then of course Laura for giving me the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Now we have yet one more, a very different, a very different approach in clinical care that Jenna's going to talk to us about. And first, you're going to tell us what you learned most this year. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenna. Um, I think a really big theme in this year for me has been learning how to look at a patient as an individual in the midst of all the, the extremely complex um, environment that we work in that, as you've seen, is incredibly multifaceted and dealing with um, really serious illnesses and, and a lot of variety in treatments and um, approaches, and how learning to treat each patient as an individual throughout that, uh-oh, <laughs> this is unexpected. Um, I can finish up my thought because it's not on my slide. but. Um, that learning how to, to treat everyone as an individual is such a key part of um, where we're going, as you've seen, in a lot of different aspects of care. And for me personally, becoming a doctor, how important that is to me to always remain at the forefront. Do we know what's wrong? Did the bulb did the bulb blow? Is there someone projectors cooling down, so it's gonna have to wait a minute. Okay. Hey. Yeah, do it. Yeah, do it. No, I don't know. Someone turned it off. <laughs> It's coming back on I think so. It looks like it. So. All right. I'm glad I get such an awake and refreshed audience. <laughs> that was a bonus. Well fed. Well caffeinated. I'm gonna wait for my timer to see her. Oh, All right, great. So yeah, like I said, my name is Jenna, and today I'm gonna be talking um, about a program I worked on for patients with metastatic breast cancer that's called the Goals of Care program. Um, a brief overview of what I've done this year at UCSF. So I've served as the intern for the Advanced Breast Cancer Task Force. And there I've mean, worked mainly on two projects. Um, one is to help develop and implement a workshop specifically for stage four patients that we call the Pathways Program. And we did the first pilot um, of that in May. And then I've also worked a lot on this Goals of Care Program, which I'm about to spend the presentation telling you about. Um, and then lastly, in a very different role, I worked as a co-coordinator of an event called Taste for the Cure that happened this October and happens every fall. So um, I'd like to start with defining a few terms that were really crucial to this program that I worked on and also to the rest of the talk. 
Um, the first is the Symptom Management Service, which is a consult service um, here in the Cancer Center that's staffed by an interdisciplinary team, including doctors who are trained in palliative care. That's their specialty. And um, what the Symptom Management Service, or SMS, does is really provides an extra layer of support to help patients deal with both physical and emotional symptoms as well as bigger picture issues, including um, advanced care planning and planning around the end of life. So I'd also like to define advanced care planning, which is a process, um, really a conversation over time between a patient and their doctor to help explore and define their values and preferences around their care in the case that they are not able to communicate those preferences when the time arrives. So part of that is assigning someone to be a healthcare proxy, who's a person that you designate to make decisions for you in the case that you're not able to make them yourself. Um, and one of the tools involved in advanced care planning is an advanced directive, which is a form to specify any preference around care in the case that you're not able to make it yourself. And so an example of that would be specifying if you wish to, ha to be put on a ventilator if that um, time arose, or if you wish to have a do not resuscitate order. Another form that's a key part of advanced care planning is the POLST form, which is the phys a physician order for life-sustaining treatment, which are actionable medical orders in the case of an emergency, and is a form really meant for people with um, a year or less to live, and specifies things like if you would want CPR in the case that um, you were found to need it. So the goals of this program, this pilot that I worked on this year, um, were really threefold. The first was to help connect patients with stage four breast cancer to palliative care services and the symptom management service early on in their treatment because the SMS exists as a resource to patients throughout the course of their treatment. It's not only something for the end of life, it's something that patients can benefit from as they receive treatment um, in oncology and are on chemotherapy, for example. Another goal was to help support patients with the process of advanced care planning and defining and expressing their goals for care. And the last goal was to really help facilitate communication between medical oncology and the symptom management service. So the way this intervention looked um, was we really used a round trip model. So I was a patient, I acted as a patient navigator and would first meet a patient in their medical oncology appointment and then would attend two appointments at the symptom management service with them where the first was really focused on um, addressing physical symptoms and the second was focused specifically on advanced care planning and that process. Then finally, I would go back to another medical oncology appointment with that patient to help make sure nothing fell through the cracks and was communicated clearly. Um, we also provided various resources to patients. One was a booklet um, provided by the American Society for Clinical Oncology that's about advanced cancer care planning. Um, we also referred patients to a website called everplans.com that on the personal side is a really useful site for storing and sharing um, various important documents. And then of course we provided them the necessary forms. Um, but the really a big aspect of this program was really patient support. So I helped coordinate their appointments um, and then I also helped them with question listing, note taking, and audio recording services, similar to what we do with decision services here in the BCC. Um, and in total this spring, um, I worked with nine patients on um, some or all of this program as laid out here, and approached about 13 people in the clinic to invite them to participate. So I'm going to be spending the rest of the time talking about an evaluation of the program. And to do that, um, I'm using a framework that comes from the theory of the diffusion, of the diffusion of innovations theory that really evaluates an innovation on five levels. The first is relative advantage, which is if an innovation provides a benefit beyond what was previously um, available. The second is compatibility, which looks at if a program meets the needs and abilities of the population it seeks to help. Um, complexity asks if a program is too complicated or too simple. And trial ability looks at the ability for a potential user of an innovation to try it out 
if that is a real, if it's hard to do that or if it's easy to get a sense for the program that way. And finally, observability looks at the potential for viral or social spread of an innovation. So I conducted interviews with um, many of the providers, both nurse practitioners and doctors, who participated in this program this spring, as well as some patients who were available to give their feedback. In terms of relative advantage, so did this program provide a relative advantage to patients beyond what was available to them previously? Um, there were a bunch of salient um, features that came out. One was that for some patients, just having a third party available to initiate their contact with the SMS was huge because in dealing with um, everything that goes on with navigating stage four cancer, patients wouldn't have, this patient said she wouldn't have entered the SMS on her own, but once she did, she found it incredibly helpful. Um, people also noticed that there was increased communication and emphasis on patients' wishes, which was a really big goal of the program. Um, and that manifested both in terms of their communication with their doctors and in their communication with family members. Um, we also found that the program helped provide, um, uh, helped open doors to other resources. So for example, um, patients get referrals to psycho-oncology um, as a result of their contact with the SMS. Um, and for other patients, their transition to hospice when that time came was facilitated by their participation in this program. Um, it was also really helpful for patients who were dealing with a host of very complicated symptoms and for their medical oncologist, for example, to be able to communicate with a true specialist in managing symptoms, which is what palliative care is all about, um, and to further have more resources to help that patient. In terms of compatibility, um, we really found that patients did have a need for advanced care planning and that that was met for some of them. So um, one patient really talked about how the process of thinking about writing down her goals and sharing them with her providers really helped her feel like she took some control back over her care and that that was incredibly important to her. And for another patient, her doctor noticed that she was more at peace um, after having had some of these discussions. Um, on another level, it was really helpful for addressing symptoms. Um, so for all patients, or for stage four patients, um, symptoms can be a really, um, there can be, a, it can really be a burden to deal with side effects and symptoms and to have an um, appointment just to talk about those was really helpful for some patients. Um, however, in terms of compatibility, there was really a variety. Um, and I found that personality was a huge factor in um, how people accepted this program, if at all. So um, there were at least four patients that I approached in clinic who turned down the service, even though their doctors really thought they had a need for it, for it and would benefit from it. I also found that patients used resources in different times and different ways. So one example was that I was making audio recordings of their appointments, and some patients never wanted the CD. Others, for a specific appointment or for all, would request multiple copies of the CD to send to family members. In terms of complexity, one way in which there was a high degree of complexity of this program was that for a lot of patients, adding on more visits was a real barrier because people are already experiencing a real overload in terms of the number of appointments that they have to manage. Um, for another patient, it felt like a lot of resources, and she didn't imagine how it could be practical. Um, in terms of trial ability, I found that um, it was, there was some difficulty on the side of providers in thinking about how to present this program to patients in a way that they, it felt acceptable to try out. And so that was a barrier that um, some people noted. But another patient said that um, it really took trying out the program to realize the benefit of it. So that's another, um, I think, barrier to consider going forward. Finally, in terms of observability and the potential for social spread, one patient said that um, she used the Five Wishes, Wishes Advanced Directive document, which is a really popular one, and liked it so much that a friend of hers ordered 25 copies and distributed them to everyone she knows. Um, another patient said she might recommend this program to another patient that she saw in the infusion center. 
So I also collected a little bit of quantitative feedback. Um, I interviewed six providers, and um, all of them agreed that there was a relative advantage in this program. Um, they all thought it was compatible with the needs and abilities of their patients. None thought it was too complex, but none thought it was too simple. Um, and all of them would recommend it to other patients. At the same time, um, four out of six of them agreed that there were barriers to trying this out, but thought that most of those barriers were really internal to patients. And finally, almost everyone interviewed did notice a difference in their patients who participated in this program. So overall, this service was really positive, positively received by both providers and patients who participated. Um, and they identified increased communication and support as features of the program that were beneficial. Um, at the same time, patients really varied in their willingness to both try out and continue with this program. And one thing I thought was really interesting was how different parts of the program were really um, most important to patients depending on the individual and um, their specific disease and where they were at with the progress um, of their disease. So next year, um, Rebecca is going to be taking my place on the Advanced Breast Cancer Program. And I'm really excited that Dr. Mike Rabo, who is the director of the Symptom Management Service, will be spending part of his time as an embedded clinician in the BCC. And so we'll be working um, more directly with a lot of our advanced breast cancer patients. And um, hopefully we can expand and refine this program to continue offering support to patients. Thank you. Now we're going to hear about more about uh, some particular issues about results and returning results to, uh, to patients from, from Tessa. First, what you learned this year. Learn. <laughs> so apologies for my voice. Um, <laughs> but hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. Um, so I would say a lot of the most important things I've learned have already been said. So I'm going to pick a different one, which is um, time management and ability to determine priorities and balance. A lot of you, this will be the first time you're working in a job where a lot, a lot is being demanded of you and you're always being pulled in many different directions and it's just important to be able to mentally sort of determine, okay, I have these five minutes now that I'm going to spend on this and then I'm going to spend this hour on this, etc. Um, and that's a really useful skill that I know will be helpful going into medical school and residency and, and a career in medicine. Um, all right, so. Uh, I have been working for the past year as a clinical coordinator for the ISPY2 trial, and I've had the opportunity in the last couple months to get involved in a project that's related to ISPY2, um, looking at returning individual research results to participants in clinical trials. So the traditional model for clinical research is that patients give of themselves in a variety of different ways um, for and participate in a clinical trial. And the information learned from that trial goes on to help future patients. Um, there's, you know, sort of thought to be pretty distinct purposes and roles for research and for clinical care. Um, research has the goal of acquiring generalizable knowledge, whereas clinical care is focused on the here and now, the treatment and decision making for a particular patient. Um, but the landscape is changing and there are a lot of views that are evolving around this issue as more and more st people start to feel that researchers have ethical obligations to offer individual results to participants if those results might have an effect on the patient's or the patient's family's health. Um, so as this landscape changes, we're now looking at those same patients who are participating in the trials, perhaps benefiting from that trial as it's happening or, or shortly thereafter. Um, and a lot of research has been done uh, looking at patients or part study participants' desire to receive results from the trials they're participating in. This shows a, a sampling of some of these different studies and the data demonstrates that the majority of study participants are interested in receiving relevant results. Um, I'm going to point out this one because it's relevant for my talk today. 93% uh, of participants in an epidemiological study of breast cancer genetics indicated that they would be interested in being notified if they had a BRCA1 or 2 mutation that was found during the course of the study. Um, so one of the big first questions is what results should be offered? All research results, some research results, no research results. Um, a paper from this June 
made a definition that analytically and clinically valid information that is of an important and actionable medical nature should be offered to a research participant. But the problem is this word actionable is still somewhat unclear and everyone kind of has a different idea of what that means. Two different organizations, for example, set out in 2013 to create a list of actionable genetic mutations and they came up with two uh, lists that were one was almost double the size of the other. Um, another issue in thinking about what types of results should be returned is um, the issue of CLIA compliance. So when you have a medical test performed, it needs to be, uh, there are many different standards for how it needs to be performed in order to give a patient a medical report of these results. Um, three of the important factors in this CLIA compliance are the laboratory needs to be an approved lab, there needs to be a predetermined validated, validated sample type that's used. And patient identifiers such as name, birthday, et cetera, need to be associated with the sample all the way through the process of completing the test. But as you can imagine, oftentimes one or more of these criteria will not be possible to meet when a test is being done in the context of a research study. Um, so there's a big question and not a lot of consensus over whether research results um, need to be done in a CLIA compliant manner in order to be returned to patients. Um, so now enters iSpy2, um, always on the forefront, trying to sort of make, take a stand on, on the various issues going on in the clinical trial world. Um, and it's relevant to iSpy2 because patients donate at various time points throughout their treatment on the trial blood and tissue for research purposes. Um, and using that blood and tissue, we're performing many different biomarker tests. Um, so we've categorized these biomarkers on ISPY2 into four different categories based on the extent of our knowledge about how these markers can predict response to a given chemotherapy or investigational agent. So the first category we um, defined are the stratifying biomarkers. These are established biomarkers with known predictive um, capacity for response to treatment. So for example, estrogen receptor positivity or HER2 positivity. The next two groups are the qualifying biomarkers from the germline and the tumor. Um, these are biomarkers for which that show good promise to be predictive of response to therapy but are still undergoing more tests. Um, and then the last category are exploratory biomarkers which are seeking new ways to predict response to therapy. Um, so iSpy2 has now completed biomarker testing for one of these qualifying biomarker sets. Um, we had germline BRCA1 and 2 testing done by Myriad for patients on the Viliparib carboplatin arm and their concurrent control arms. Um, and Viliparib is one of the drugs that has graduated from the trial. And um, it's a PARP inhibitor and BRCA1 and mutations in the BRCA1 and 2 genes have been shown um, to predict response to these PARP inhibitor drugs. So iSpy2 wanted to look at this in our patient population, but now we have results for very clinically relevant and actionable um, you know, patient information, specifically the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And, and there's a big question about whether there may be patients who we've performed this testing on who might not already know this information, maybe they weren't re recommended to have genetic testing previously or chose not to. Um, and so this um, example of a biomarker test being done in iSpy has really brought this question to the forefront about whether or not we have an obligation and an ability to report these individual results back to patients. There are a lot of complicating factors um, for the return of, res of results, even for this case where I think a lot of people seem to have agreed, we've had various phone calls and meetings with patient advocates and clinicians and genetic counselors who agree that these results are probably pretty important to, to report back. But um, the samples that were tested by Myriad did not have patient identifiers attached to them. And they were done using Buffy coat, which is not the sample type that Myriad requires and has predetermined to be the validated sample type for its commercial BRCA1 and 2 testing. So they have um, dictated that confirm confirmatory testing will be required for patients who are interested in receiving an official report of the results, um, even though they've already been done in the research setting. Another issue that we're facing 
is the fact that the patients on whom this testing was completed signed a consent form that specifically stated that none of the results from the research that was being performed on their blood and tissue would ever be given back to them, to their doctor, or put into their medical record. So these patients now need to be reconsented to the possibility of receiving individual results. Um, and if a patient consents to generally uh, wanting to be contacted to receive individual results when, if and when they become available, then she'll be offered these myriad results in particular um, and consented to those. So the plan going forward, once we reconsent the patients, notify them specifically about the myriad results that are available, and perform confirmatory testing on interested patients, um, a clinician and or genetic counselor will meet with the patients to provide the myriad results and offer counseling. Um, so as we've, I've sort of mentioned, the BRCA1 and 2 case is a little bit clearer than some others because it's a very uh, established test that we know has uh, relevant actionability for patients in terms of surgical decisions or thinking about um, whether family members should get genetic testing. Um, and so a lot of the conversations have focused more on biomarker types which are going to be more controversial, controversial in sort of thinking about whether we should be reporting these back to patients. Um, there's a big issue ar around our ability to interpret these results and educate the, pa uh, the patients appropriately about them. Um, clinicians need to feel comfortable being the ones who most likely will be responsible for meeting with the patients and talking to them about these results. And that, of course, becomes much more difficult if we, as you know, the academic side, don't fully understand what these results mean for a patient. Um, another issue is whether confirmatory testing will be required in every other biomarker case as it is for the Myriad BRCA1 and 2 case. Um, for testing that happens in using tissue, we have a much more limited supply. The patients, you know, donated a certain amount of tissue and we can't just go back and take more in the same way that we can um, in getting another blood sample for confirmatory testing. So looking ahead to my next year here at the BCC, um, I'll be helping with the process of writing up this new <laughs> consent language and um, figuring out exactly, you know, how we'd like to move forward with um, being able to offer individual results to patients. We're going to be, it looks like, moving forward with the Myriad uh, results as our first sort of test case. And then I'm very interested in evaluating, um, you know, kind of how we did in terms of the process that we created for returning these results to patients. Um, we're going to be looking at the impact on the patients, both of the results themselves and what they mean for their health and their family's health, and on kind of how this process went and if they felt that it was confusing or clear or, you know, done in the appropriate manner. And we're also going to be eliciting clinician and genetic counselor feedback on the process as well. And then, of course, discussing um, the next biomarker results, which are kind of coming down the pipeline and thinking about whether those may be appropriate to report back to patients as well. So big thank you to everyone involved, um, the patient advocates, Jane Perlmutter in particular, Susan Flynn, who's done a huge amount of work on this, um, everyone at the BCC involved in this project, in decision services, Mike Wong, my partner in crime, um, in all things I spy clinical coordinating, and um, the patients I've worked with and the wonderful interns I've gotten to know. Okay. Okay, I hate to see the day end because every presentation has been so fantastic. So, well, no. So I know Mitch will not disappoint us. And uh, <laughs> bring it home, Mitch. Right. Okay. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for being here, all the troopers who uh, have been here since uh, this morning. Um, so um, my name is Mitchell Hayes. Um, this year, uh, my biggest role here at the BCC has been um, coordinating the target trials, which are the intraoperative radiation trials here at um, UCSF. Um, and in addition to those trials, I've also been working on a number of cost effectiveness studies, um, one of which I will talk to you today about. Um, but first, the most important thing that I learned here um, at my year at the BCC. Um, I just want to mention two things really quickly. Um, one is an echo, I think, of what uh, my previous interns have said. But um, you know, uh, I've really come to appreciate the power of per uh, perseverance. Um, and especially um, when you're trying to implement, um, you know, just new ideas that, um, 
you know, no one has ever seen before. And um, there's even if it's a good idea, there will definitely be a lot of resistance. And sometimes because it's a good idea, there'll be a lot of resistance. Um, so just keep that in mind um, when you're trying to, you know, um, change things. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, uh, with new projects, you possibly it's 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 impossible to put um, too much time up front to make sure everything is in order before you actually start the project. So um, for all you interns who are starting projects, uh, make sure you work through all those details ahead of time and then um, because, you know, snowball effect and whatever. Okay, so um, on to uh, the talk here, which is uh, um, the cost effectiveness analysis of adding Herceptin to uh, treatment of HER2 positive ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. So first I want to give you a little bit of background about HER2 positivity in DCIS. Um, for invasive cancer, we know what HER2 positivity means. It usually means that it's a, um, a high risk feature for people with HER2 positive um, invasive cancer. However, the, um, the role um, in DCIS disease progression is more or less unknown at this point. There have been a few preclinical trials to show that it is in fact a high risk feature for DCIS, um, but this has not been shown in any large clinical trials, and so as a result, um, the NSABP a few years ago initiated a large randomized clinical trial to show how Herceptin is actually going to affect the local recurrence risk of people who are receiving breast conserving surgery and radiation already. So um, there's two arms of the trial. Um, you either receive Herceptin or you won't receive Herceptin, but everybody received breast conserving surgery and radiation. However, some have noted um, in the uh, sort of wake of the announcement of this trial initiating that um, uh, that even for high-risk DCIS, um, an lumpectomy and radiation is actually already a very effective treatment um, for, for DCIS. And so um, it's left some uh, with a few questions, um, one of which, or a couple of which, are um, I'm going to try and answer today, um, which is, one, is it worth adding a very costly drug to an already um, effective drug, um, I'm sorry, treatment regimen? Um, and the follow-up question to that, um, depending on the first, the answer to the first question is, if it is not cost-effective, are there any conditions under which adding Herceptin to the treatment of DCIS is actually going to be cost-effective? Um, so let's actually back up a little bit and talk about cost-effectiveness cost effectiveness in general. Um, how do we measure cost-effectiveness and really what does analysis mean? Um, the, the, the central question we're trying to answer here is, um, uh, it, when you're comparing two treatment strategies, is the most effective strategy also less costly? Because clearly that would be a superior treatment if we were trying to decide between two um, treatment decisions. Um, but many a times um, it happens to be that the more effective treatment is also more costly. And so um, you want to really think about in that case uh, how much we're going to have to pay in order to go from the less effective treatment to the more effective treatment. And that's really, you know, we're, we're asking that from a societal point of view. And so that's really what a cost effectiveness analysis is trying to answer. Um, so our primary endpoint here um, is really a balance between cost and effectiveness, and we have a label for that uh, in, a co in the cost effectiveness world, which is called the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or the ICER. Um, the ICER is defined as, um, it's a value that is the differences in the cost of the two treatment strategies over the difference in the effectiveness. And the effectiveness can be me measured in one of two ways. Um, the first one is life years, so how much uh, treatment is actually going to extend um, the lifespan of a person. Um, and actually, we care uh, in uh, our cost effectiveness analysis more about the quality adjusted life years because we want to really be able to, um, you know, adjust for um, non equal health states um, and, and take into account, you know, a metastatic state versus um, uh, being well without a recurrence and, and the sort of difference in the quality of those two um, health states. Um, so this value uh, is what we're looking for in the end, and it's going to tell us how much it's going to cost to switch from strategy A to strategy B in the case that um, our more effective treatment is also more costly. Okay, so let's look at an example here really quickly. This is an analysis that looked at um, chemotherapy only for metastatic breast cancer versus th that same regimen plus a new drug, which is uh, bevacizumab. And um, in the lower left-hand corner, we have chemotherapy-only strategy, and then in the upper right-hand corner, we have the, uh, the new strategy with bevacizumab. And um, in this, is, this is one of those cases where the more effective treatment is also more costly, so we really want to look at that ICER. And so, um, again, that's difference in cost over difference in qualities, and that ended up being about $232,000 per quality. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, well, actually, it means that in uh, the United States, this is actually not considered to be a cost-effective treatment strategy because we're only willing to pay, as a society, about between $75,000 and $100,000 per quality-adjusted life year gain. So this is really above our threshold, and therefore this analysis is really showing that bevacizumab is not a cost-effective treatment strategy for metastatic breast cancer patients. 
Um, so let's go back to our model here. Um, our model uh, used a Markov flow model in which you, uh, a hypothetical cohort, cohort of patients started out um, with their initial treatment, which was the breast conserving surgery and radiation, and they either received Herceptin or they did not, depending on the treatment strategy. From there, they started out as well, but they may or may not develop a recurrence over time. Um, for this model, we had a few baseline conditions, which is that we simulated the model over 15 years, which is about how much um, long-term follow-up data we have for DCIS treated with the lumpectomy and radiation. Um, the costs that we've inputted into the model were equal to Medicare reimbursement values. And most of the other cost probabilities and utilities, which um, are quantified values that rep represent quality of life, um, were taken from the literature. So these are already a very established values. But we did have to make a couple of assumptions about, um, about our model um, to begin with because there are a few inherent unknowns when it comes to HER2 positive DCIS. Um, so what we did was we just adopted those values directly from the NSA BP B43 protocol, um, and the, these were values that they laid out in their background, and also the values that they needed to assume in order to um, take into consideration their, um, their statistical analysis. And so those, those included the patient demographic breakdown, the overall recurrence rates for people who did not receive Herceptin, and then also the fundamental unknown here, which is what the clinical trial is trying to answer, which is the local risk reduction um, that Herceptin actually gives you if, you if you're taking that treatment. And so for your reference, that risk reduction was assumed to be about 36%, um, which is going to be an important number. We're going to come back to that later in the analysis. Um, the second assumption that we made was the, um, that the addition of Herceptin um, treatment on top of the breast conserving surgery and radiation did not reduce the overall quality of life for these patients, um, which is really a conservative assumption when you think about it because um, that's assuming that you have uh, negligible toxicity effects of adding Herceptin and then also that the, um, the, the complications associated with infusion, just giving somebody infusion at all, um, were, were negligible as well. So that's, that's, that's a conservative assumption. Here are our baseline analysis. Um, we did end up um, uh, having a more effective but also more costly treatment, which ended up being the Herceptin strategy. And so we're going we're gonna to have to look at our ICER here to see if, uh, which, which treatment is, is more cost effective by our standards. In the lower left-hand corner, we have the no Herceptin strategy. In the upper right-hand corner, we have the Herceptin strategy. And the ICER ended up being about $300 per quality adjusted life years. And so like I said before, in the United States, we're, we're only, sorry, what did I say? $300,000 per quality adjusted life year. And so, um, like I said before, in the United States, we're only about willing to pay at most $100,000 per quality adjusted life year. And so by this analysis, it's not uh, cost effective to add uh, Herceptin to DCIS treatment um, under our baseline conditions and assumptions. So um, what we wanted to do from that point, though, so we, we've kind of answered our first question here, but we want to really make sure that our analysis is solid and that none, um, not a single variable in our analysis is actually going to have a lot of weight over our model itself. So what we did is we adjusted each variable into our model by about 20% to see if it would change the model's outcome. And we found that none of the costs or and none of the probabilities actually changed the model's outcome within a range of 20%. Um, notably, none of the utilities that were taken from the literature I, um, changed the, uh, the model's outcome either. So we've really, um, we've, we've taken our baseline analysis and we've, we've sort of adjusted each of the variables to see that our analysis is solid and we've really answered this first question here. Um, is it cost effective? No, it is not cost effective under our baseline <laughs> conditions and assumptions um, to add Herceptin to treatment of DCIS. So now we want to move on to this next question, which is that because it is not cost effective under, uh, under our baseline conditions, um, what would it take to actually make adding Herceptin treatment cost effective? So um, we looked at a couple of things. The first one was that the cost of Herceptin, which is actually, you know, which is um, a variable that might change over time, um, given that Herceptin currently, there's a drug patent um, on it, and it might be cheaper in the future. Um, it would have to cost about 40% of its current Medicare reimbursement value, which again are conservative, um, low, low cost values in the things of all, in the world of uh, reimbursements. And so um, that's, that's kind of a drastic reduction in price. Um, the other thing we want to keep in mind is that um, the local recurrence risk we would want here is about 88% if, um, you know, if, uh, if we wanted to make this tre treatment strategy effective. So if NSABP B43 ended up showing that you had a, a almost 90% risk reduction with Herceptin, um, then it would be cost effective to do that, but in all likelihood that's not going to happen. Um, the last point here is that the utility of receiving Herceptin treatment would need to be about 0.5 more than receiving Herceptin. And so um, the operative word here is more um, because, um, it, th again, we made a conservative assumption that, um, that uh, receiving Herceptin is actually not going to lower your quality of, not of life. And so um, you would actually, that quality of life with receiving Herceptin would actually have to go up. And so, so really we've, we've passed our ceiling here of possible values. So I want to show you that in a graph here we have. 
um, I, I took two really important values that we, um, that we adjusted and created this graph. In the lower um, half of the graph, we see that it's an area where it's not cost-effective to add Herceptin. In the upper hand part of the graph, it's cost-effective to add Herceptin. On our x-axis here, we have the Herceptin risk reduction, so um, 0 to 100%. Um, even if you have 100% risk reduction, there's still not going to be cost-effective at some point. And then on the, on the um, the y-axis, we have the utility of receiving Herceptin. And so we, our baseline case is right here. And again, this 0.9 value is um, assuming that the quality of life has <coughs> not lowered by adding Herceptin treatment. And so what that means is that you're creating an effective ceiling um, uh, at that value. And so uh, the realm of possible values is really lower uh, part of the graph here. And so that's mostly not cost effective. OK, so a couple of conclusions. Um, in most scenarios, adding Herceptin is not really a cost effective treatment. We saw this with our analysis. Um, and it would, it would also require a dramatic decrease in costs in order to make adding uh, trastuzumab a cost-effective treatment. And we might be able to see this um, in the future once the drug patent on Herceptin has, has finally expired in 2019. However, in the meanwhile, millions are being, currently being spent on a randomized clinical trial in order to show that Herceptin is actually um, effective. Um, and so um, some may argue, Matt, that this could be uh, put to a better use while Herceptin is still a very expensive drug. Um, and so um, the takeaway points that I want everyone to, to, um, to have here before they leave is that um, because industry is not going to advocate for a societal cost effectiveness sort of abstract, you know, academic, seemingly ap academic thing here, <laughs> it's our job as investigators to really um, sort of uh, adhere to this philosophy that it's important to consider cost effectiveness when you're thinking about trial design and you're thinking about resource allocation and um, all these important things um, that are associated with preparing for clinical trials. Um, so I want to I acknowledge a few people here really quickly. Um, Michael Alvarado is my PI, Dr. Michael Alvarado. I appreciate everything that uh, he did this year for me. Um, he was the PI on all my projects, basically. Alyssa Ozan couldn't be here today because she's at Dartmouth, um, but she is actually the person who taught me all about cost effectiveness. Um, and uh, also Laura Esman, who's the director of the program. And uh, thanks for letting me be here. And then, of course, a host of other people that I could not think enough. Okay. <laughs>